Thank you for joining this episode of Healing Race. In this episode, Todd and I discuss whether a kind of psychology of ownership where white people feel the right to black lives and what they produce has endured from the time when black people were the property of white people. And if it has, how prevalent is it currently? How can we actually tell if a white person harbors this kind of psychology of ownership or if behaviors that might look like racial prejudice or even racial superiority come from other motivations? The conversation you're about to hear arose from Andre and I discussing whether the killing of George Floyd would lead to an enduring movement or would only be a moment. Is there psychological resistance to letting these moments become movements? Let's get to that conversation now. Enjoy. in, in uh, a unique situation with respect to race because black people were once the property of white people. Mm -hmm. And I want to delve into the psychology of that. And that may be really difficult for some who watch this video to hear. Yeah. We were once their property. Yeah. And when you own property, you've owned property, you feel as though you can do as you please with that property. And there's an entire framework, an entire psychology around ownership and the value you derived <clears throat> from that ownership. And I think one of the, I think one of the reasons that maybe moments struggle to become movements is with respect to race, there is a contingent of people who don't want to release that psychology. I mean, an entire, not of ownership, but the psychology of well. And what I mean by well, you are part of the group that were once owners. You're the descendant of the group that was once owners. And there is a, there is a comfort in that. Because we all know that humans rank things, right? That's human nature to rank. And you rank higher than others. Mm -hmm. And also an entire society has been constructed to allow that rank to help you have advantage in life. Some wittingly that you know of, that you, you know, wittingly take advantage of. Others unwittingly that you just passively take advantage of by virtue of being part of a group. Sure. And when you ask people to relinquish a certain framework of thinking, especially now, I think in the clear kind of George Floyd moments, it's, it's obvious, but it's easy to, uh, to return to your safety zone of thinking about your life, especially when you feel threatened, you know, in, in some smaller moment that is not a national, international, you know, you know, headline grabbing thing, right? Maybe a black person gives you bad attitude or whatever at a store or cuts you off in traffic, whatever it may be. And those small moments still give people an opportunity to retain that psychology and to live in that motivation, the motivation of I'm ranking higher and that feels good. Yeah. And so when I say I wanted to challenge you, I, 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 I want, what I'm trying to say is that when, and you know this, you understand the human mind, that when you are asking people to give up something that has literally been the bedrock of, the, of their being, right, as a white person, which that is really hard to do. And I think that's one of the reasons why moments become struggle to become movements. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, as maybe the white person asks his or herself, you know, well, how much do I need to do? Like I'm willing to alter, but do I have to radically alter my worldview all at once? Or can I evolve it over time? Yeah. How, how it did with homosexuals, right? And of which I'm a part of that group. Yeah. And that's, that's another thing I'm like, this is interesting. So, 
At one time we were booed. <laughs> now we're on hell, we host redecorating shows. Like, you know, and I think, and I think I'm just using that as an analogy because it's the closest thing I know in my own life because I am gay. Yeah. But I, you know, that had to evolve over time. And we live in such a young country. And a lot of people forget that the US is really young vis-a-vis -vis a lot of these other countries. And that has grown and changed so fast that I think sometimes we, you know, we step back and maybe regress a little just because we're fearful of so much change, so much alteration to a worldview at once. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. So just so I'm clear, so, you know, you said you wanted to challenge me. I'm assuming you want to get my thoughts, my responses to that. Yes. Just so that I'm clear on what it, you said that in response to something that I shared about what I think would lead from a moment to a movement, right? And are you saying that you are skeptical about that being, that you agree that that sense of trust and that sense of benefit of the doubt, are, are you are you saying that you- I'm saying it's fleeting. I, I'm, I believe it's fleeting. You, that you believe, so you believe it's fleeting because of this sense of advantage, the psychology of some kind of advantage yes. that um, kind of overcomes that ability to trust. Yes, in the smaller moments of our lives. When, yes. And I believe, because you know, in the smaller moments of our lives are when we're really challenged, right? When you have your own interaction. Yeah. And th that's what I'm saying, what you just yeah. summarized. Yeah, okay, okay, so. You agree. so what I'm what I'm sensing. So I agree with you that any kind of interracial trust would need to be enduring for it to be effective, right? So and you are saying so. What I'm hearing you say, if I'm correct, you're saying you just don't think it can be enduring because there's this other psychological dynamic that is a headwind right it's a in the short term yeah in the short term yes i do think there is a worry among some portion of the white population and i'll even some some su substantial portion of the white population <laughs> about what they'd have to give up to create greater equity um, let's, talk I mean, are, let's talk about that yeah and so and i i want to say something also on the river on the other end of it which is just because there are on average, so if you say on average is a white person concerned about what they'd have to give up, you know, that that advantage of being white, um, I it would have to be yes. Does that mean that every one of those white people feel that to a degree that it really makes a difference in their, their racial relationships? Um, I would say no. I would say there's people who are low on that scale, and I would say there's people in the middle, and I'd say there's people who are really high. And my concern are the people who are really high and you know high-ish. But I do like to speak to slavery very specifically yeah. because of the psychology of ownership. ownership. I, re I, and I remember having this conversation with a Latino man a few years ago, and I said, yes, you all have the other races of people have been you know discriminated against done wrong whatever parlance you want to use by white people but i said it is slightly different i said and i and i i illustrated it at the time because i said there was a day in this country and i pointed to another friend of ours where i would have been his property and he could have done with me whatever he amused he could have taught me to read he could have beat the hell out of me he could have sold me he could have fucked me yeah whatever because i'm his property yeah. And the site and the psychology of ownership is powerful. And you're you're talking about something that you once owned now wants to be on your level. Mm -hmm. That's 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 all I'm saying is that it's powerful. Yeah. And there's still undercurrents in it in society today. When you 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 talk a lot about this idea of the psychology of ownership. What how do you think that materializes across the white population? So okay. let's, let's let's ask a really specific question. <laughs> do you, do a you justification, think, a justification. You think I carry around 
a feeling of ownership over black people? And well, in what way, if, if yes, if yes, in what way does that manifest? No, 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 I'm not, not, not in, how can I say this? Not in ownership in the sense of a bill of sale. Okay. But ownership, and stay with me here, in the sense that you have a right to my life. Mm. whether it's to dress the way we dress, whether it's to take copyright away from our songs, whether you have, a, you have an inherent right to my life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean when I say ownership. And it manifests itself, in my opinion, as a justification for when wrongs are done, meaning I'm justified in this in maybe a racist action or discriminatory behavior because I, by virtue, I have a right to his black life. Mm -hmm. And that's honestly what I, when, when I saw the tape of, you know, George Floyd having the life, you know, draining out of him, that was my overarching thought. I said, this Derek Chauvin is doing this because he believes he has a right to. He has a, he can do with this, he has a right to this black life and he can do with it, whatever he feels, even if it pleases him to end it. Yeah, that's literally what I thought during that nine minutes. Yeah, yeah, and I don't. I think that's probably right. That that was a component of his psychology that was at play there. I guess I just don't really know that. Again, this might be living in different worlds in the kind of course of our lives. I just don't think that psychology is as I just wide as wide I spread I as agree. you as you think I, so, I, so I, I, I know it is and I just I wholeheartedly categorically just I so tell just, me something I mean and I, I really don't take offense to this I want you to know like I want you to you know this is I, I want you to be honest what would like what would I have done so I can get I I can own that if I see opportunities in the world, I'm going to feel a sense of confidence to going after them, right? And, and that that feeling of confidence will have been, has been given extra support by the fact that I'm white, okay? So that, that's something that I can, that I can own and feel is probably true to my experience, okay? But I also know that if I were to come across a situation where I was wanting to achieve something, wanting to take advantage of some opportunity, I would feel a sense of a, of a barrier when I felt that I was overstepping what was in someone else's domain, um, in, 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 you know, including someone who is Black. So I just don't know the degree to which I am, you know, material materializing a sense uh, that I own whatever you as a black person have or have created. Well, what well, okay, you personally know because of your own makeup, your own psychology. But remember my definition of own as right to your life. Mm -hmm. So I have a right to, for example, let's you said, you know, um, achieving something, right? And when you said college admissions came up, there are people who believe that they have a right to a space by virtue of, at a school, by virtue of being white over a black person, even if that black person is better qualified or, you know, tests better, et cetera. Yeah. They have like, like you have no, you have, I have a right to your life meaning the space at this particular school, not the school that we went to, I'm saying in general that a, as a case in point, that a space at a school that a black person wants, a white person has a right to it if they want it by virtue of having, and that's what I mean by ownership. Like I have a right to your life. Mm -hmm. I have a right to, 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 to 
in, uh, to infiltrate, be a part, do whatever I want in your community or with or around you by virtue of the history of this country. I have a right to your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I get, I get what you're, I get what you're saying. And that's why I kind of spoke about the kind of confidence and in trying to attain some kind of goal position yeah, but, they, but, places you put it but they, when you but let's go with that because when you expound on that further when you that's fine have all the confidence there are a lot of white people with confidence but yeah. when you don't get the opportunity and i get the opportunity and you yeah. have the feeling wait a minute why like hold up i know i'm better than him i yeah. have I, I don't care maybe if he has more experience, et cetera. I have a right to that space. Yeah. That's not confidence. That's superiority. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I, again, I, I guess I would, I guess I just haven't, I haven't seen anything in, I have seen things in my life that show me that some people feel that. So I don't doubt that that exists. And I don't even doubt that it exists more or less pretty expansively. What, what, I, what I am skeptical of, and I haven't seen anything in my experience or in research to suggest, is that that is something that is universally felt to some major degree. Um, so I, I feel like I... You I know a lot of people who you, you wouldn't, and the research wouldn't bear it because you all are black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's a, talking about a white experience, right? So, so, so say, say a little bit more because I'm not, I'm not sure I understand why I wouldn't see it. I'm talking. I'm not necessarily talking about a white experience. I'm talking about a white motivation of yeah. which I'm the target. Yeah. And that's why your your experience you the thing when I'm just when I'm telling you right now you're never going to have this experience because you're never going to be the target. No one's ever going to say I have a right to Todd's life. Yeah, because nobody used to own you. Sure. No, I understand. I, I get what you're saying. The 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 perpetrator of let's say an abuse is the word you like to use still has an experience of themselves. Um, or their friends and their their co you know co group members also have an experience of them, and I guess I just I think I know a lot of people who would be fine giving up that position. It's not that they wouldn't be disappointed, but I don't think that they carry around with them a sense that they deserve it because they're white. <laughs> well. Ask, ask your friends to search their hearts. I'm not saying it's when I when I I'm not saying it's every single like white person in America. Yeah. But what yeah. I am saying is that this is an ethos in America. Mm -hmm. and it's an ethos with a pretty grand undercurrent. And the reason I feel I know this is because my friends and I have been targets of it. Let me give you a specific example that I'm yeah. thinking of, yeah. where a friend who a friend has a friend and the who is white. So the friend I know is black, who has a friend who is white. Who's white? Okay. And this uh, particular, you know, white friend was very deliberate about dating black people mm -hmm. and and going and almost like going after them, right? And almost to, well, not on a, almost, but to the direct observance of my friend and that person's Black friend. Like, you seem to have a very deliberate desire to go after people in, in our race, to date them, right? And there was one particular person that white friend was interested in, and that, and the person was not receptive. The person was like, oh, you know, I'm not interested. Yeah. And but he but that that the non the non-interested party had not met the white friend. And the white friend proceeds to tell my friend, who is black, you make sure you tell him that I'm white. Make mm -hmm. sure you tell him that I've seen this play out all the time. 
make sure <laughs> make sure you emphasize that I'm that I am white, meaning by by virtue of being white, that person should want me. It makes me more appealing, and I have a right to go after this person because of that white status. Mm -hmm. This happens. This is an ethos. This is a real thing. I'm not, this isn't delusion. I'm not making this up. I'm not doubting that, that there is a sense of white, greater white value among white people um, that exists in the world uh, or that exists in the country or that even that it exists in some, again, across a broad range of the population. So I, I don't doubt that at all. I guess, what, I guess what I'm, go ahead, no, go ahead. Well, what I was adding to that is that giving them the self-assurance to, to, to be a part of, to, I don't wanna use take, but that's the word that comes to mind, what they please. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think what I'm trying to say is, I, th I think there's a parallel to a previous part of our conversation, which is what I'm putting, what I'm putting out there is you expressed, so let's go back to the idea of physical, physical harm, threat of physical harm. And I expressed based on history, right, based on real lived experience and the experience of those people around you. I, un I understand not only the fear and the desire to protect your, your physical being, I also understand how it would make you cautious and skeptical in your relationships with white people. So I, 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 I get that. And that you don't know one, the difference, you, you, there's no way you can possibly know at least you know, at the beginning, when you're first meeting somebody, which side of the ledger they're on, right? Or where on the spectrum they are, because it's usually not either or it's, you know, it's a, it's a spectrum of intensity of, you know, one's feeling, you know, one's propensity to, to inflict harm, you know, across racial lines. So I don't, so I, I, I understand all of that. And at the same time, I, I, I think we were able to acknowledge that there's probably a lot of white people that would not do you harm. Uh, you would, I, I acknowledge the complete rationality of that skepticism and that caution, given what you feel could happen. And at the same time, there, there are still a lot of people that wouldn't do that, who you might be skeptical of. Um, and you're skeptical because you don't know who they are. Um, and that makes sense. That, that dynamic completely makes sense. And I'm just offering that maybe that's the same dynamic here, that I understand why you might worry, feel, be cautious about, be concerned about, whatever words you would use, that there are people across the white population that believe they are superior and through their belief that they're superior, they believe they should have what they want um, or have a greater right to what they want. I just also think at the same time that there is a range of degrees to which that is the case for any white person. And that what I would suggest to you is there are a lot of white people who, and that's why I was using the word confidence, who, yeah, they might come off as really confident, but I don't know that. No, no talk, no talk. This is not confidence. Yeah, no, not I'm, not, I'm not suggesting, no, I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's confidence. I know you're not talking about confidence. Let me, let me say the, the backward way. I'm gonna suggest that there's a lot of white people who really do not have a feeling that they have a what you put a right to a black person's life or whatever that life encompasses, um, and that there there could there could be the possibility. The reason I keep saying confidence, I don't want you to think that I'm what I'm saying to you is that all the ways in which what you have seen as white superiority, um, some sense of white superiority and ownership is just confidence. I'm really not trying to say that. I really mean that. Um, what I'm trying to say on the other end is that there might be people who are confident, who show a certain kind of behavior that looks like it, 
but is not it. And I just think there are a lot of white people who really don't feel that sense of ownership. I, I think there are a lot that do and to greater or lesser degrees. Um, <laughs> but I, I think there, I, I think it's possible to be a white person and acknowledge the rights that black people have to their lives um, and what that means. I mean, do you don't, do you think that's possible? I guess. I accept your perspective. <laughs> You're not going to convince me out of mine, but I accept it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, good. Um, you no, know, I really have to go so I can cook. <laughs> I know. I know. Probably not the, the best the best spot to end on but well, we we'll, can have we can continue this i mean this has been thoroughly enjoyable yes. it also makes me really glad that you're my friend i know that we you know like because what we're doing i love these kinds of exercises is like exploring ideas and we're yeah. giving ourselves you know both the the physical space and it's we've cultivated a space of non-judgment and like i just said i didn't just say tom you're crazy i said i accept your perspective you know yeah. like you know I, I just love this i love this so i'm gonna ask you i mean there's a question that I, i'm probably gonna i mean i don't have to ask you right away but i will ask you at some point and probably the next time we talk um and and i don't want to like catch you off guard with it and, uh so i'm just gonna put it out there there's very little that you could ever do to catch me off guard oh i just want yeah <laughs> Anyways, I guess what I would wonder, and we can again talk about this later, what I would wonder is what would show you differently? What would it, how would you be able to see, what would you see that would make you convinced of a white person? Okay, let's not say even say a broad range of a white person not feeling that sense of ownership and that right over a black life or again, what's encompassed in a black life. Like, how would you know that a white person didn't have that? What would prove that to you? Let me think on that. Think Let on that. Think on that. <laughs> so, the, the, so the initial answer, why I chuckle, the initial answer is nothing. Okay. So, but maybe I doubt it will, but maybe my attitude will evolve when, you know, by the time we have our next conversation. But the okay. initial answer is nothing. Okay. That's fair. That's the honest answer. I like that. Thank you for watching this episode of Healing Race and stay with us for a scene from our next video. If you wanna see more conversations like the one you just watched, please subscribe to our channel, share this video with friends and family and like and comment on the video below. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our episodes and have an open, real conversation about race, email us at guests at healingraceshow.com. And if there are topics you think we should cover, we'd love to hear them. So please email your ideas to topics at healingraceshow.com. As always, thanks for your support. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Now, here's a scene from our next Healing Race. When you have one cast of people creating the playbook for how another cast of people get to live and manifest and present in this world, that's power. And all I'm saying is that the white people, like I told you before, I said they've been in charge from the day they landed on this country till today. And that is not happenstance. That's not look, that's not being better in life. That's called, that, in my opinion, that's deliberate. To watch the rest of that episode, go ahead and click the video below me. To see a different compelling Healing Race episode, you can click the video below me. We look forward to seeing you in the next video.